I don't think this issue with the debt ceiling and the budget ever gets resolved until House members are elected for six years. And here's why. Because the answer is in entitlement spending. There are some fundamental things that should be tweaked and fixed in entitlement spending. Um, but no one's going to touch it as long as the House gets elected every two years. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. It is a uh, real joy to have um, Jeff and uh, Sharon with me today. Before I read their bios and dive into a conversation with them, um, today happens to be my birthday, um, and I've gotten a lot of uh, texts from clients of ours saying, as my birthday gift, did I give the market a 327 tenure? Um, no, I obviously didn't have anything to do with the 327 tenure, but I will say that a 327 tenure is welcome news to many people in the commercial real estate industry. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to have these two incredible professionals with me to talk about what's going on in the markets today, uh, more broadly about the overall uh, markets and banking sector and SVB and sovereign bank failures. Uh, down into uh, commercial real estate, what's happening in the various different asset classes, um, and uh, anything and everything going on in Washington uh, that people on this webcast ought to know about. So let me dive into two quick bios on uh, Sharon and on Jeff, and then we'll start in. So Sharon Wilson Gino is the president of the National Multifamily Housing Council. She's a 30-year veteran of the housing industry, during which she has helped guide numerous for-profit, non-profit, and governmental entities around housing affordability, community development, and other housing policy changes. Sharon most recently served as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Volunteers of America National Services, the housing and healthcare affiliate of the Volunteers of America Parent Organization, and one of the largest nonprofit affordable and mixed income, mixed use housing operators in the nation, operating 240 properties and nearly 13,000 units in over 40 states during her tenure. Before joining Volunteers of America, Sharon was a partner in a private practice in Washington, D.C., where she advised on housing and community development projects, government contracting, corporate structure, internal governance, and compliance with federal, state, and local laws. Jeff DeBoer has been at the forefront of national policy affecting the real estate industry for the past 35 years. He's the founding president and CEO of the Real Estate Roundtable. The Roundtable represents the leadership of the nation's top 150 privately owned and publicly held real estate ownership, development, lending, and management firms, as well as the elected leaders of the 19 major national real estate industry trade associations. Roundtable member portfolios contain over 12 billion square feet of office, retail, and industrial properties valued at nearly $4 trillion. Um, Jeff, we might need to update that $4 trillion number, but... Um, uh, which, which way? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, and over 4 million apartment units and in excess of 5 million hotel rooms. Um, participating trade associations represent nearly 3 million people directly employed in the real estate industry. So let's start here. Let's start big and wide. Failure of SVB and Sovereign and the impact on commercial real estate. Let me uh, turn to you first, Jeff, of what you've seen since those two banks failed, the government's reaction and uh, actions to them, uh, and how you think things sit today. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Willie, for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to see you again. And, and Sharon is a it brings a wealth of experience to helping us in Washington sort things out. But let's be honest, Susan Weber runs the whole show. So thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, what's going I mean, look, I, you, you know, interest rates go up 475 basis points in 12 months. So something's going to break. And we saw it break in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley Bank and to a certain extent, Signature. And, you know, I think that that, is a wake up call to a lot of people that, that, you know, we've had a, an era of very easy money for 12 years where interest rates have been right around one, one and a half percent for most, you know, business borrowers and so forth with a little bump on it. And so for very, very long, and that obviously created, you know, upward pressure on, on values. And when those interest rates went up so steep and so fast, it's not that 
uh, most people in the industry, in our industry, didn't want normalization of rates, but going up so fast, uh, obviously uh, impacted those banks because of their security holdings. But it's indicative of what I think, you know, if not watch very carefully what could happen to other banks, regional banks, small banks across the country in terms of if they had to immediately account for these new values. And we can get into that a little more deeply, but certainly- Do you still, do you still get, Jeff, just on that, sorry to jump in, but do you still get right now in talking to legislators that they're still concerned that the crisis, if you will, is still underway and that there's still work to be done? I mean, should we expect the FDIC, should we expect Treasury to come out with anything? Or do you think they're sitting there with their fingers and uh, toes crossed saying, hey, maybe nothing else happens and the worst is behind us? Well, no, I think I think members of Congress are very focused on this and very concerned, uh, not that they're all that well informed on it necessarily, but they're informed by publications and so forth. And publications are certainly indicating that there are problems out there. So I think Congress is going to exercise a great deal of oversight and probably, you know, try and, and reinstitute some of the regulatory uh, uh provisions that had been rolled back over the last few years. So they're highly focused. And I think at the Fed and, and the regulatory agencies, uh, they're focused, they're concerned. You know, this is a new new game that they're they're in to a certain extent. So I don't think anybody is just, you know, saying, you know, uh, let's move on. I, I think everyone is focused very much and, and concerned about what some of the unintended consequences might, might be here. Sharon, do you think that they, that the, that the FDIC or the Treasury needs to step in and change the insurance rules and and raise the limit of deposit insurance from 250. And and is there any real work being done on that or any any proposals being contemplated? There's a lot of talk about it right now, um, and and I think the lawmakers have said they're going to have a thoughtful review before they make any precipitous changes. But again, you know, regional banks have been such an important part of the multifamily sector, especially in recent years, um, and especially over the last year or two, as we've seen an interest rate environment increasing uh, for construction lending. And, um, you know, that, that can be a riskier business, but it, it's vital to the success of building the housing supply that we need in our nation. And any regulatory changes that would cause those institutions to take a step back or reevaluate their role. I and mean, it's already starting to happen quite a bit. Um, we're hoping that, uh, you know, ultimately things calm down and that remind re, that uh, resource of regional banks remains an important part of the construction lending part, which is a, a, a huge part of getting any housing done, period. So do you think, hey, Willie, can I just jump yeah, in ahead. on one more yeah, thing? Jump, Jeff, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. You know, obviously the, the reason that you would want to raise that insurance on that is, is to stem the fear and the outflow of capital from these banks to the money center banks, because as Sharon says, that's a lifeblood source of, of capital. So, you know, I do think people are going to talk about it. I, I've been starting to hear about the concept of a of private insurance, you know, where people would get private insurance to cover it. And, and I, I don't know, but I, I do think that we obviously don't want depositors pulling their money out as rapidly as, as they did in SVB. So I, I guess the issue here, though, is, I mean, you you mentioned it, Jeff, that members of Congress are concerned. They obviously have lots of local and regional banks in their, in their districts and in their states, and therefore they're concerned about it. They clearly are not the most well-informed, not trying to throw darts at any of our very well-elected politicians, but nonetheless, this isn't sort of their um, strength, if you will. I mean, uh, is there a fire drill going on inside of FDIC and the OCC right now to say we've got to do something and do it quick? And my sense is that the crisis sort of happened now that the regionals have sort of stabilized. It feels like things, people are just kind of waiting. I mean, I saw the First Republic stock chart this morning on Squawk Box and it falls off precipitously and it's been flat ever since. It's not gone back up and it hasn't gone down. It's just flat. My sense is, are regulators happy to see a flat line or First Republic or do they want to see that move back up to where First Republic's stock valuation was previously and do they need to do something to make that happen? Well, let me say one sentence and then I'll get out of the way for Sharon, but but I don't think there's a fire drill going on at the regulatory agencies to look at, at this stuff. I, I think there's a, you know, you know, a serious concern and serious watching, but I don't think there, that there's a, a fire drill. There's more of a fire drill, if you will, maybe, but I don't even want to call that that, but on in, in Congress to, to learn how 
this risk wasn't wasn't uh, you know expected. Sharon. No, I, I completely agree with Jeff. It, if you talk to the regulators, I think they very much feel like we've got this. Like we were, this is how, this is the work we do. We know what we're doing. We're working through it. Um, but I, I do get the sense that there is some concern about, to Jeff's point, the other fire drill, which is the congressional oversight and, and trying to overcorrect in a place that could truly have detrimental impacts on the capital markets moving forward. So I think that's probably the bigger danger. Yeah, and apropos to real estate, I think that there's an intense focus on, you know, concentration by banks in real estate and what could happen or may not happen. And, and you know, so so I, I, to that extent, I think the regulators are very much looking at, at, at institutions. And, you know, we've sent a letter over to the Fed to urge that they give a little time, you know, as the all these this, this trillion plus wall of loans it comes to maturity in the next 24, 36 months and, and just give people a little time to settle down a little bit coming out of the pandemic, understand where the demand is going to come from. It's obviously changed in terms of telework and everything, but, but, uh, and where's inflation, you know, I mean, if inflation suddenly drops to the floor, as was suggested by a few well-known real estate mavens in the last few days, then, you know, maybe interest rates come back down at the end of this year. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think so, it could ultimately have a bigger impact, you know, as we start to see, we'll talk about more about today, um, you know, as, as things roll out of the, the office sector, um, I, I think we'll have, we haven't really seen the full impact of it, I think, in the multifamily side yet, but that could come as banks are trying to balance what happens on their office side. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that's, I mean, you, you mentioned it, Sharon, is that the, Banks writ large, not just local and regional banks, but the banking system um, has 65% of the commercial real estate loans in the United States on their balance sheets, 65%. So a, a massive supply of capital to the markets. And if you look at what the Biden administration came out with last week, as it relates to we need more liquidity and we need more oversight in the banking system, those two things to me say liquidity as much as SVB had the most liquid balance sheet of almost any bank in the United States, which is you know, the irony of all of this, but they're going to push for more liquidity, which says you're not going to extend capital to commercial real estate because it's illiquid. Um, and then over oversight, increased regulatory oversight to make sure that what happened at FCV, SVB doesn't happen. Uh, and so almost any way you kind of look at it, doesn't that mean that banks pull back from commercial real estate lending? And then the question would be, other than the agencies in HUD and multifamily, who fills the void? Um, and, and so, Jeff, I'm assuming your phone has been ringing off the hook for the last three weeks from predominantly your non-multifamily constituents on the real estate roundtable saying, we've got a liquidity crisis. We don't know where we're going to get financing for our next office project, retail project, uh, industrial. Um, whereas Sharon's phone has probably been ringing a little bit, but not quite to the same amount as yours. Is that a, am I accurately depicting sure. the last three weeks of your life, Mr. DeBoer? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, so, what's three the weeks answer? ago, I had a full what's head the of hair and was six foot eight. But look what's happened to me because of all of this. But, but, but what's uh, the answer when they call you and say we're concerned about liquidity? Are you going to say that private capital is coming? Banks are going to come back in. FDIC is going to raise the insurance limit, which is going to make it so that regional and and, and local banks can start to lend again. Well, I, first of all, I kind of think the 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 concept of additional regulations and expanding liquidity are, are kind of counter to each other. And I think, you know, and, and from, from our perspective, and yeah, it's, the phones are ringing a lot in the office sector, but also as Sharon and you said, I think we all ought to be concerned about how these regulations, and if they, you know, if they criticize these office loans too much, they're gonna to have to reserve against them. There's gonna to have to be a lot more equity put in. That's gonna take capital out of, the possibility of being lent on on all kinds of assets across the country, the good ones as well as not so great ones. And so we're concerned about this kind of spiral maybe start, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but you, you don't want to get in a situation where, you know, they're criticizing these loans or reserving against them, then their values are going down further than they're reserving against them, and it just spirals out. So um, yeah, it, it's, and, and I think they're aware of it, the regulators are, are are, are aware of this and, and, and watching it. But, you know, again, we're coming out of the pandemic. Look, 
you guys in the industry, people assume certain risks. You assume, assume market risks, demographic risks, financing risks, and so on and so forth. But I don't think anybody assumed a 12-year period of, of basically zero interest rates followed by a steep 500-point jack up in the financing costs in the midst of a pandemic that shut everybody down and, and changed a lot of the ways that that offices and, and all types of built the built environment would be used. And this has to settle out, I think. It has to, you know, it has to be allowed to settle through and transition. We ought to be working together and the federal government ought to be helping people transition to that new world. And, and Willie, to your, to your point, you know, uh, my phone has been ringing more about the agency lending. And, and, and you know, this was the whole reason the agencies exist, right? Um, to provide that kind of liquid capital to the housing sector at times of more volatile private market uh, circumstances. So while Jeff, I, I totally agree with you, the ripple effect of what happens in office and what's happened at SVP and, and Signature is going to push down on the multifamily side, on the banking side. Um, our members are looking ahead and saying, okay, what's going on with the agencies and how can I be sure that I continue to rely on them? And at the same time, this banking situation has sort of come up. Um, we're seeing this whole other overlay of the federal government uh, taking steps through the White House's blueprint for uh, resident rights to signal that it may step in here and change some of the rules of the game and how it does its, its, um, its investment and put additional regulatory constraints on that. Um, so that, that's the bigger uncertainty right now for folks on the multifamily side is like, okay, I, I know how to pivot from more of a banking uh, source to the agency source and that's okay. But if, if that agency source is gonna change the rules of the game um, significantly, you know, then what am I going to do? And, and that's that's a real big question for folks right now. Do you see, uh, Sharon, how about construction, housing, construction, financing? Is that more at, at I don't I, I honestly don't know whether agencies are financing that or how it's done, but they're not. But Jeff, it's a great question. I want to jump to that in a second, but I want to okay. I want to pull on Sharon's point for a moment as it relates to the Renner's Bill of Rights. So do you think, Sharon? that there will be significant changes to agency lending guidelines based off of the Biden administration's push to uh, get various component parts of the of the tenant bill of rights put forward? In other words, I mean, do you think that there could be a measure in there that would either make it so that there has to be some type of rent control on properties financed by the agencies uh, or anything else of that nature? There are a lot of proposals out there, most certainly. And I, I do see the agencies and, and the other federal agencies struggling with what they know best, which is that they, they step in between the, the regulatory sort of government side of it and they have to interact with the private markets. And they know that these kinds of overcorrections on the regulatory side are gonna hurt the private market um, investment in the multifamily sector. And they also, you know, again, we have some really good people, I think, in this administration that are working on this issue. So they're trying to balance political concern with what they know is the ultimate goal and the best thing for the American people, which is creating a, a market that supports increasing the housing supply in this nation so we can have affordable housing and so people can have a roof over their head. And increased supply is really the answer to that question. Do I think there's going to be national rent control? Um, I think, again, the research on this is, is strong, that, that rent control does nothing but hurt both quality and quantity of housing, which we desperately need. So uh, to the point where, like, you know, we've been talking to economists about doing some updated research, and they don't even want to do it because they think the question is sort of asked and answered. Um, so, so I think the data and the information is on our side. There are political headwinds, most certainly. Um, I, I think that there will be some enhancements to both the agencies have some voluntary programs and, and not too many people have taken advantage of them because they don't think the incentives are strong enough uh, to control rents at a certain level predictably to serve um, always uh, some group at a, an affordable rate over an extended period of time. Um, but we have made the effort and we will continue to make the effort to enhance those programs so there are opportunities to do this on a voluntary basis rather than a mandatory basis. Um, the agencies have been very clear with us. There's no, there's no effort to like go backward on existing loans. So that that's that's good. 
So the, the one thing that I would say from having been in Washington for the past couple of days and doing my rounds at both on Capitol Hill in regulatory agencies, at the agencies, blah, blah, is that there clearly is a voice that has gotten its way into D.C. that is focused on renters' rights and um, evictions and unjust evictions and things of the, that nature. And to anybody who's listening to this webcast who is an owner, um, I know personally, and as I said to certain regulators that I met with yesterday, I said, you know, I the, 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 the renters' rights people and my rent is too high have done a very good job of bringing in XYZ renter who got evicted because of XYZ reason. And um, what they've missed is the flip side to it all, that many, many owners, you know, a friend of mine who is a landlord said, you know, there are few worse terms today in America than being a landlord. Many of these landlords have done incredible work to keep people in their homes, to give them rent forbearance during the pandemic. And the industry needs to speak up. The industry needs to, for every person who, quote unquote, wrongfully has been evicted, there needs to be 15 other cases of landlords doing the right thing to keep people in safe and affordable housing. And so I would just say this issue is a big one. I know both of you are on it, but to anyone who's listening to this webcast and this thing does go quite far and wide, if you are concerned about this issue and you have cases of where you have extended help, you have sat there and allowed someone to sit in an apartment for six months rent free, those stories need to make their way to Washington and to the regulators because the voice of the renter right now is winning the day. Well, and there, it's, a, it's something of a false choice too, Willie, because there's this perception that, you know, the, the relationship between the housing provider and the resident is always contentious. Like it, it always has to be a bad relationship. That is simply untrue. And, and those of you on this call and those of you that have worked in this industry for a long time that know that is the exception and not the rule. Yeah. And, hey, and that, that's the perception that we're really trying to change through some um, some targeted media, through some research that we're doing and some other and other initiatives as well. Yeah. Jeff, what were you going to say? I, I was I was just going to say I, I'd push back a little bit on what you said, Willie, in terms of I think that that Sharon and her team in particular helped help shape that Biden statement in a way that it really there wasn't much in it, you know. And it could have gone the wrong way because you're right, the, 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 the renter advocates, if you will, are quite loud. But I, I, I think that at a national level, uh, you know, it's, it's been muted a little bit. But I do wonder why they get to be called housing advocates and we have to be called housing lobbyists. That just isn't fair. But I, I, told, I told Jeff when we, when we met last week, I said, I am a housing advocate and I will, <laughs> will not let that term be stolen. Look, I mean, one of the so two things on that, Jeff, I think a on the 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 if you want to call it the white paper or whatever the White House put out as it relates to the tenant bill of rights and their proposals there that the industry and NMHC and the roundtable and others did a fantastic job of informing the White House of not only what was going on on the market, but as well what was legally viable, if you will, as it relates to them going and trying to do, for instance, national rent control. With that said, with that said, the administration, from my read of it, is hell bent on taking pieces of that and putting it into place. And one of the areas that they actually have the ability to do something without Capitol Hill is with the agencies. And so that's the that's the piece of all of this that is very delicate and needs to have the industry talk about all the great things that they're doing to protect their tenants, to give them safe, affordable housing. Um, because right now, I know for a fact that the tenants' right groups have been in and said, hey, we need a, you know, Fannie and Freddie loan should only be made on properties with rent control. And at a time where liquidity across the system is challenged, the last thing we need is anything even close to that. Anything that would go into saying, you need to have X, Y, or Z further restricting the deployment of capital from Fannie and Freddie. No, and in fact, that is our job moving forward, Willie, absolutely. Um, and, and this process is just starting. So we will be starting next week. And, and we've been in there a lot. We spend a lot of time with the agencies and their regulator. Um, and, and we've been having these conversations. Um, the good news is, is they also, in addition to having uh, an obligation to serve, 
uh, on the affordable side, they also have an obligation for the safety and soundness of those agencies. Right. So, so they're trying very hard to balance those two things and being sure that any steps they take, if they are to take any steps, are deliberative, thoughtful and will not upset their um, their really important obligation for the safeness and soundness of the agencies. But you're right to be concerned, Willie. I mean, you look yeah, at no, yeah. right. So let's segue into uh, construction lending because that was one of the, that was Jeff's question because Fannie and Freddie obviously can't provide construction loans, um, whereas HUD can. Um, and one of the big issues that is on the table right now is that, you know, the We've got an inflation flight fight going on with the Fed. We're trying to get, I mean, interestingly, one of the things I thought was interesting about this morning was we actually got a, a bad jobs report, if you will. And it's the first time that bad news actually has hurt the market. So maybe we're sort of getting back to a point where actually bad news is is not helping the market, but actually the market starts to adjust to bad news is bad news. And that, I guess, in the long run, says that Powell's done his job and we can stop seeing these rate rises coming. But on construction lending, um, HUD's been good for about $5 billion a year of D4 construction lending. And if you think that all the regional and local banks in the rapidly raising rate environment of the back half of 22 wrote almost no new construction loans, and clearly at the beginning of 23, no one's writing construction loans, you think about what that means for deliveries. And we're speaking, a bit, speaking about multi right now, but we can talk about other asset classes in a second. Deliveries in in the back half of 24 into the beginning of 25, there will be no new inventory, which will mean that asset values inflate and rents go up, which is exactly what the federal government doesn't want to see happen. And so one of the big questions here, Sharon, is can we get HUD and the D4 program to become more market competitive, if you will, and go from a nine to 12 month underwriting process to make a new loan to something that is more market rate of one to three months, which is what you get when you go to Bank of America or JP Morgan? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm 110% behind you on this. I think the D4 program is a great program, but but it has it has its issues, obviously. Uh, I think the biggest struggle at HUD is not the will. Um, it is the bodies. They simply do not have the workforce that they need um, to process loans in a better way. And they're, and they're saddled with a regulatory scheme that is frankly antiquated. Um, I think there is an opportunity here, especially given where the markets are gonna sit for a while from an interest rate environment and, and, and the desperate need for um, of housing, particularly on the affordable side and the administration's commitment, and keep in mind before the Tenant Bill of Rights was issued, they made a commitment last May to increasing housing supply. This is an opportunity for them to step up and step in. Um, what that can look like for them and how soon they can operationalize that. And can they do that in a way that's going to make sense for the markets and not put us further behind on the supply side is a question that remains to be seen. But there is truly an opportunity here. Yeah, I, I, I sit there and think about the billions and billions of dollars that are being flooded into the banking system to prop it up, if you will, and 160 billion borrowed from the window last week. And I think about the fact that there are 1,200 people in the multifamily group at HUD. I mean, you'd think if it's a manpower issue, we could put more government resources to it. And if it's a systems issue that the federal government would sit there and say, we need to upgrade the system so that HUD looks like Fannie and Freddie. But um, will be to me to, 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 to poke too hard here. But I mean, I, it just... It, it make if you added five billion dollars of construction lending out of HUD and they doubled it from five billion to ten billion on, a, on an annual basis, that would add back of the envelope forty thousand new units of multifamily supply into the system that's by nature affordable. And so you'd sit there and you sort of say, why is that not something that the administration, as they talk about tenant bill of rights and potentially trying to do something on rent control? We all know it's a supply issue. So why wouldn't they be looking at HUD and trying to marshal resources to say, let's get this going so HUD can supply that capital at a time when we know regional and local banks just don't want to part with those dollars, thinking that there might be a run on the bank? Yeah, it, it definitely is a supply issue. But having said that, I think that last year, at the end of last year, weren't there more uh, multi-units uh, being constructed than at any time since 1970 or something like that. De before, deliveries. Like, before deliveries. the banks went on de strike. Sort of de thing. Deliveries into 23. So it was yeah. delivery. So yes, the, the construction pipeline coming through in 22 yeah. into 23 was at an all-time high. But Jeff, that's all getting delivered now. 
We're yeah. talking 24, 25, 26, which if this banking crisis remains for a period of time, you're not going to have new shovels coming into the ground and you're not going to get new deliveries in the back half of 24 and the beginning of 25. Yeah. And not to go in a totally different direction, but all of this is interrelated. There's a, the workforce for construction projects across across the industry, you know, is people are looking for for workers and so forth. But so there's a lot of problems here. But let's segue that, Jeff, into another sector, which you've been focusing a lot on, which is office. And, yeah. you know, one of the questions would be, should HUD be doing construction loans to convert office buildings to multi? OK, it's a question. Should they be writing loans and have an expert group inside of HUD that can sit there and say, we do construction on D4 ground up, but we also can do an adaptive reuse program to take abandoned. And I put that I use that term too, probably yeah. loosely, um, yeah. but office buildings that are impaired and convert them to multifamily in some of these city centers, which right now have a real occupancy issue. Talk for a moment about what you're seeing on the office side, because you're you were just in San Francisco, one of the most challenged office markets in the country. Um, a, what are you seeing? And B, what's the what's the future on office? Well, you know, I, I I mean, look, not every underutilized office building can be converted to housing anyway. It does require a, a certain type of building and, and so forth to, for this to work. So it's not for every building, but it, at the margin, it would help. And there are quite a number of conversion underway now and people looking at them, whether HUD should provide financing or not, that's an interesting idea. I hadn't really you know, considered that, but certainly banks, again, liquidity is gonna be sucked a little bit out of the system here, right? And so the idea that they're gonna be able to provide that financing is a bit speculative, I think. So having HUD do it, but we're really focused more and with Sharon on a tax credit idea to uh, help uh, owners, investors convert buildings into uh, into housing, model kind of off after the low income housing tax credit, because it's very expensive to do this stuff. Everybody knows that. So some government assistance, whether it's HUD lending, maybe, maybe it's both, you know, uh, and, and it can be helpful. The office sector in general, obviously, um, uh, probably the most challenged part sector of the of the industry right now, because of whipsaw government policy, frankly. I mean, low interest rates, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, demand changed dramatically. So, you know, we're trying to help on both. And we're on the, at the Fed trying to encourage, uh, you know, a, a little, little more flexibility in working out these loans as they come due. There's a mountain of uh, office loans that are coming due, and, and they're all across the country. It's not just New York or, or Chicago. It's all across the country, and they need to be worked out. They need to have new equity put in, no doubt. They need to be, uh, you know, repriced, no doubt about it. But it will take time. And so we're asking the regulators to do that. On the demand side, you know, the public sector is slowly inching back to the workplace. And on this one, you know, yes, we, we want to create and uh, stand up demand for office, but it's more of a big picture concern about cities, frankly, and and if in some markets, the federal government has a big footprint here in D.C., they do. But in other markets across the country, they have a big footprint. And the federal government, you know, is still acting as if there is a pandemic going on. And so they're they've got very liberal telework, work from home rules. So we want to encourage, you know, on on May 11th, uh, the government, the, the reset will occur in terms of all of the emergency programs to respond to the pandemic are being reset and, and over. And we're trying to get, uh, you know, uh, Congress to pass a rule that will require the federal government, that is the agencies, to go back to pre-pandemic rules. We'd get a lot of people here in D.C. We got 800,000 workers in D.C., 200,000 of which are federal employees. Now, if they're at home and they're not downtown, the small businesses suffer, the transportation suffers, safety issues suffer, the prop, uh, tax base suffers. And so, you know, we're focused on getting people back, back to the office as much as possible, understanding that we're not going back to the old ways. But again, we need to, you know. Jeff, how, how, is it, how is it that Chuck Schumer, who runs the Senate, yeah. has, a, has a slight majority, yeah. um, isn't, and also has one of the largest office markets in the country, 
Forget yeah. about how many federal workers are in New York office. Just talk about the office market. How is it that he is not pushing the show up act harder to get that passed? It's through the house and it's stalled in the Senate. How is it that the leader of the Senate isn't sitting there saying we should do nothing beyond passing the show up act to get federal workers back in because that's then going to cascade down into workers across the country to do exactly what you've just talked about. Because unless there's leadership on this issue, unless people get back into the office, all of those contagion effects that you just talked about, everything from the local deli that doesn't have anyone going to buy a sandwich at midday to the parking garages that don't have cars that are now coming in, to public transportation, to public safety, to police forces, and then to the tax base in the cities across the country. How is this not right at the top of the list, even close to where we're talking about the debt ceiling right now? And we'll talk about that in a moment. But how is it that Chuck Schumer goes home tonight and doesn't think the show up act has to be passed? Well, uh, I'm not saying that he doesn't go home and, and think that. I mean, I, I, this is this this is, you know, I, I do believe that there are behind the scenes conversations going on with Democratic senators predominantly about this issue. You know, it was passed very partisanly in the, in the if that's a word in the House. You know, they moved that we sent our letter and said, you ought to do something about this. And all of a sudden, the House, right when they came back, Republicans passed this with very little discussion. So it became a partisan issue, which is too bad. And over in the Senate, I think that it's, it's you know, it, it, they work pretty slowly up there. But I do believe that, that there are uh, a lot of discussions going on. And, and I think that this is possibly something that could be included in the uh, debt ceiling negotiations. You know, look, Congress is back, uh, you know. Mayors have their people back. States have their people back, by and large. Some don't, but by and large. And the, and the private industry is trending to come back. So the federal government is a laggard here. And they should be helping this transition to the new world, not being you know, a force of, of additional challenges here. But I, I think that, that Schumer... Now, the reality is, from, from a political point of view, the federal uh, employee unions you know, don't, don't like it. Um, well, I mean, I, I would just soon be at home myself, but, but, uh, I, well, I, I, think yeah, let's, I mean, so I, Chair, J Jeff had mentioned the, 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 something that you all are working on, on a tax credit, uh, for conversions. What, what, what's kind of the, what, what's the genesis of that? Or what are we, what are you all looking at there as it relates to some type of tax credit on conversions? Senator Stabenow from Michigan's actually taken the bull by the horns here and introduced something in the last Congress and is planning to reintroduce it again. Um, and we recently had a conversation with her around doing about a 20% details, a little bit unclear. The, the working draft of the bill that they have, we think still needs some work um, to really target uh, buildings that could be redacted and be really user-friendly for, for the industry. So we're working with her staff on that right now and we expect that to be reintroduced here, I hope shortly. Um, there's also been some legislation kicking around the last Congress to expand the Opportunity Zone legislation to make it more user-friendly for multifamily and adaptive reuse as well. We think there's opportunities there too that could use it, in both cases, using the tax code to incentivize adaptive reuse. Um, but And the third piece, and Jeff alluded to it, uh, earlier, um, query federal federal buildings. Um, while we have a, a, a ton of them here in Washington, there are federal buildings all over the United States in different cities and different hubs. It, could there be, if the federal workforce is coming back in, in some hybrid fashion, are they going to be consolidating their office space like others are? And would there be opportunities to use federal land uh, for housing, particularly affordable housing? That's an opportunity potentially as well. I haven't seen that in legislative language yet, but that's been something that's been sort of talked about among policymakers. Um, NMHC and ULI recently did a, a report, and this is more of a case study report on adaptive reuse. And in talking to a number of academics, um, you know, obviously there's a huge focus on this in New York. Uh, yeah, this is one opportunity, but it is not a panacea. Uh, as we all know, the, the floor plates and the utilities and the way um, office is structured doesn't necessarily make it um, well suited in all cases for reuse. And, and our estimates are right now that maybe between 10 and 15% of the office uh, environment could be easily or, or readily adapted for multifamily use. Uh, short of being over under where the teardown makes more sense. 
So, um, so while it is one tool in the toolbox, I mean, at every tool in the toolbox, using the tax code to incentivize, it's certainly a great idea, but it's not going to take all of that um, office uh, re and retail space, I'll put, throw that in there as well, um, and, and make it reusable. Yeah, it's, a, it's part of the menu. I mean, work out some of these loans, give flexibility to people, get people back in the workplace, convert some of these buildings into housing, but the problems are, will still be there for for a, a lot of people, and we should just recognize that. But we've, we've got to help at the margin, and, and and each one of these little pieces, and there's other stuff too that that I think would be helpful to, particularly the office sector in cities. So Jeff, the, the the just a little bit of sort of DC on the debt, your perspective on the debt ceiling, and then the president's budget. Um, well. With, give, give, give listeners a little bit of, do we need to be concerned about the debt ceiling or do you think that McCarthy strikes a deal and gets that done? Can he strike a deal with the, with the? I guess it's fair to call them the Tea Party members of his, of, of his caucus um, and then on the president's budget? Yeah, well, I, you know, we've seen this movie a number of times, haven't we, where we go right up to the precipice to, and to jump off and on the debt ceiling, and then there's an agreement reached, and and all of the, you know, chattering and nervousness was not worth it. But uh, you know, this one might be just a tad different. You know, I think that that it might go a little bit longer and and go a little bit more to the edge. You know, um, I do. I'm optimistic that that at the end of the day they'll reach an agreement and extend the debt and not default on the United States government you know that would be terrible and I think that at the end of the day there's enough people that realize that having said that there's also a very strong contingent in the house that wants as part of this deal spending cuts which will be very very difficult to do because so much of the budget has already been taken off the table in terms of didn't uh, McCarthy take entitlement reform off the table? Yeah. I mean, hasn't McCarthy already? I mean, if you think back to Eric Cantor and Eric Cantor, um, and and I guess it was even before Cantor, but the the, the in 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 past impasses, yes. it's been the Republicans asking for entitlement reform and the Democrats saying we're not going to touch entitlements. But didn't McCarthy take that issue off the table? So then, what's the rub? Yeah, he did, but but it's not necessarily always been entitlement spending. It's also been process. You know, the whole uh, Graham uh, Latta budget nonsense. All of these things were were part of a deal, and they were a process issues, not necessarily specific spending cuts. And 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 I think that you know there could be some of that in this. And and I do think that that the House Republicans are are serious about that, and that does raise some more concerns than we've had in the past. And, and I would tell everybody that's listening to this thing, if you talk to a member of Congress, urge them to pass this debt ceiling, uh, you know, uh, particularly given what's going on in the capital markets already, this could, this would not be good, but, but, you know, at, at a principal level, you know, Schumer to McCarthy or, you know, principals talking about this, I'm not sure those conversations are going on in a very robust fashion right now. I think that, you know, staff is kicking things around and and trying to develop things, but um and 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 we don't know when we get to the to the cliff, you know, will it be, you know, uh, next month or or June or July, some people say, how many of these gimmicks, so to speak, can treasury use before we default on the debt. So there's all these moving parts and um, you know, yeah, I'm a, I'm more concerned than last time, I guess, I would say. That's, that, I don't like hearing that, but that's helpful to hear. Well, um, you know, yeah, I no, just, I, it's look, one man's opinion. I mean, I don't no, know. It, but one, I man, one man who spends a lot of time talking to the people who have their finger on this switch, if well, you will. Well, look, when, when, when Speaker McCarthy went through the election, you know, it, it took 15 ballots to Right, able, exactly. And, and, and there Let's were some hope. commitments. There Let's were... hope they at least have communication like the Republican caucus did on their 15 rounds. So they were actually speaking to one another, because as you rightfully say, Jeff, the way we've gotten through this in the past is actual communication between the White House during the Obama administration when this first became an issue. And at that time, Speaker Boehner. And by the way, we don't need to get into it, but Speaker Boehner shut down the government for, I believe it was 11 days due yeah. to the Hastert rule. 
which well now, that was it, now I'm really getting in the now I'm really getting that, in the, but just to yeah we but that was over the budget not the debt ceiling we have not defaulted on on debt payments before and this is a much more serious for markets and for financing if it were to go forward. And it's a tough thing to educate, to talk to members of Congress on this. That's why I'm saying that everybody out there ought to, ought to voice their opinion on this. All it means is that we pay our credit card bill that the government's run up in the past and future spending should be in the budget. You know, And you mentioned the president's budget. I would just say that it's um, uh, interesting reading if you need to go to sleep sometime, but uh, I, I, I mean, look, th these are big ideas. They're the same ideas that 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 the party, the Democratic Party has wanted. Well, the Democratic Party doesn't control everything, so it's not going to happen, you know. Uh, but having said that, all of these things have standing, you know, in this in the sense that once they're out there, they might not get done now, but they have standing. That's why 1031 is always talked about. You know, it's a revenue raiser. It has standing. That's why. You know, all of this stuff, it it's, it's comes up every time. And if you're not paying attention, you're not working hard, and Sharon knows all about this, then 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 it sneaks through the cracks. So, um, Sharon, there's a bunch in the president's budget. Go ahead. No, no, there's a bunch in the president's budget for affordable housing uh, and increasing everything from um, LIHTC to HAP contracts to all sorts of different things. Does the president's budget get through? Uh, you know, I'm with Jeff. No, I'm not with Jeff in that I actually love the federal budget. I think it's fascinating reading. And, and it really, I <laughs> wow. do. I, I read it every year. I really, I, I, it gives you sort of the blueprint of what, uh, you know, a particular administration sees the trajectory for the future, even though they don't have to be responsible for it because they're not going to be in office for more than eight years. So, um, you know, it, to me, I, I think it's really fascinating. But no, I, Sharon, I, Sharon, wait a minute. That is so sad. I know it's twisted, but it's, it's true. I, one it's time true. somebody called me and said, how, how are you doing? I said, living the dream. And they say, you must, it must be a nightmare. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> it's Go twisted, ahead. but it's true. Um, <laughs> Excited to see a lot of those affordable housing, particularly initiatives, really in the in the budget proposal. Um, this is, I think, an attempt by the administration to do what they said they were going to do back last May, which is try to make good on this housing um, supply plan that that they had proposed. The problem, as Jeff points out, is all the pay fors are. Uh, 1031 and other tax incentives that are also investing in housing, including preserving and developing new affordable housing. So you're giving with one hand and you're taking away with the other. I mean, the bottom line, my, my view on this whole thing, and I'm going to say something a little bit provocative. I don't think this, this issue with the debt ceiling and the budget ever gets resolved until House members are elected for six years. And here's why. Um, because the answer is in entitlement spending. Um, you know, when you take out entitlement spending and, and defense spending, non-defense discretionary makes up about 20% of the budget. So that's everything else. And you start pilfering through that and, and sure you can cut it all 50%, but there are some real significant parts of the government in that 20% that, um, nobody wants to, to get too far down and then they'll continue to squeeze them like they have. This comes up every decade or so. Um, at some point in time, and then when you start talking about entitlement spending, the House is never going to deal with that because they have to get reelected every two years. There are some fundamental things that should be tweaked and fixed in entitlement spending, um, but no one's going to touch it as long as the House gets elected every two years. And I didn't mean so to apply to this the conversation every decade. Yeah, there are good things in the budget, and Sharon mentioned some of them. And and in the last tax bill, the the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, one of the things that we're highly focused on is implementing those energy saving provisions that were in that bill to in, to encourage people when they retrofit to to engage in more energy saving practices. And we're now talking to EPA about. Uh, you know, how you can have a voluntary incentive to be a lower carbon emitter, not just saving energy, but a lower carbon and do this on a voluntary basis. We're trying to get ahead of it so that, you know, government doesn't then mandate you to do things. We want to do it in advance. But uh, I didn't mean that the budget was a total waste of time, only partially, I guess. So, Jeff, you, sorry, Sharon, it, Jeff, you did, a, you, did, you did a bunch of work on TRIA and on the, the terrorism uh, insurance bill that got reauthorized. 
Um, one of the issues that is coming up kind of across the landscape in commercial real estate is the cost of insurance and how in due to the climate change and, and due to potential flooding and due to these storms that seem to get more and more ferocious every day, that the cost of insurance has gone up precipitously. Is there anything going on at the round table? And Sharon, I'll come to you as it relates to trying to do anything about this, or is this just the market playing itself out and insurers will charge for insurance what they want to charge and the market will clear it? We're following Sharon's lead. Well, <laughs> Um, we're, um, we're, we're actually in the process of completing insurance survey, which a number of our multifamily members, uh, we had huge response this year. So thank you to everyone for doing that. And, and obviously this is an enormous issue um, for, uh, for folks. And, and when we see these cycles periodically, and, and so I think there is an opportunity to have this conversation and um, because it, it dovetails nicely with a lot of the conversation around climate, generally speaking, um, this is a, th these two things go together. Um, while we've seen cycles before, and then you know, insurance rates drop, and then ten years later they come back up, and we have these uh, we have these cycles. I don't think the reset this time is going to come back down to what we're used to. In part because we've had all of these um, climate and hazard incidences, particularly over the last five to seven years, and I think there is some. Uh, some recognition that those kinds of payouts are here to stay. Um, so we're going through the data right now, and, and it will be a tool that we use in our advocacy to get some help and relief from uh, potentially from Congress to help support the, the insurance piece. And, you know, some people talk about having ba banks, other lenders, you know, do the sustainability uh, testing and so on and so forth. And that's another aspect of, of all of this that could continue to drive that insurance insurance up, I guess, Willie. Yeah, I, I, I will say just as it relates to the environmental, uh, environmentally friendly, both um, retrofitting, as you mentioned, Jeff, uh, and then how it can have a big impact. It is too bad, Sharon, that on the multifamily side with Fannie and Freddie, both were very focused on green lending for a period of time. And during the last FHFA director's tenure, they pulled out the incentives for them to focus on green lending. And the impact that that had as it relates to water conservation, energy conservation was dramatic. And it's a, it's a shame that that lending program, if you will, that was having a real impact on even the way that people were built, constructing new buildings, because they'd come to us and say, what do I need to do as far as, you know, uh, low water usage toilets and showers and LED lighting to build into this building so that it could be actually bought by someone who was going to put agency financing on it. And we don't hear that anymore. And it's a, it's a, it's a real shame that there isn't that focus anymore from the agencies on, on green lending. No, I think that's true. And, and a lot of time, it took a while to get there, right? So a lot of time and effort was invested in building the infrastructure to do that kind of lending because it, it, it's not easy. I mean, you have to have the mechanisms in place to monitor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, while for the agencies to take a step back now under new administration and step up into, and, and really lean into that again, it's going to take a minute for that to, to really come back up to the forefront, but, but you're absolutely right. This is a long-term play and we've got to start now um, or we're not going to have impact in the future. Uh, I think the substitute for that though, for the time being, is, as Jeff pointed out, there are a number of, of fairly aggressive tax incentives in the budget uh, proposal that if they were enacted, they could help support perhaps multifamily and other real estate uh, in making some of those changes as well. But again, the pay fors are are going to undermine us too. So it right. becomes this sort of weird zero sum game. So um, let's focus on 24 for a moment. Um, and uh, just as people, the two of you know Washington uh, better than most and uh, sort of how many seats the Dems and the Republicans have to defend come 2024, the presidential election. Um, Jeff, let me throw that hot potato over to you. Before you go to focusing on 24, though, you're always really good, Jeff, at finding the new members of Congress, whether in the House or the Senate, 
who are exciting because they come to their jobs with a different perspective. They were in the military before coming in. But every roundtable meeting that I attend, you always bring in some new man or woman who has been elected to the Senate or Congress, who's sort of that new voice on Capitol Hill. Can you give our listeners any insight into anyone on the in the House or the Senate who you think is kind of the exciting a man or woman right now who might gain some real uh, headway as it relates to being a uh, opinion leader inside the Republican or Democratic Party? Um, yeah, I can. I, I wish I would have had time to prepare for that question, but I can off the top of my head. <laughs> in, the, in the House, there are two really, 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 in my opinion, young members of the House. There's a, a number of impressed, but two guys that I've met recently that, that I think are just great. Um, uh, Richie Torres, both both of these happen to be Democrats. Richie Torres from uh, the Bronx, I guess, and um, Joe Neguse from Northern California. And both of these uh, members of Congress, I, I think, are really, really dedicated members. And not that the other ones aren't, but I mean, they, I think they're they really come to the office with fresh ideas and 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 enthusiastic ways of doing things. So there's two out of 435. Um, uh, you know. I, per, I, you know, I, I'm not down on, I think these, I think these men and women come to Congress and try to do their best job and they, they do it the way that, you know, maybe we all don't agree with them, but, but somebody does, or they wouldn't get elected and, and they're just pr promoting their point of view. And I think that most of them are trying to do good things. The vast majority are trying to do good things for the country and good things for people and good things for communities. And, um, and just flipping yeah. from two male Democrats, what about Katie Britt from Alabama in the in the Senate? I, I, look, I I I love I, I think Katie Britt is is great. As she brings she's the first woman ever elected out of the state of Alabama. She was on the Hill for a long time. She's a business executive. She's only forty one or two. You know, in the Senate, she's got to stand in line for a lot of things. But I think over time. Her voice will be uh, will be very very loud and and very effective. Thank you for mentioning her. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. And and Sharon, as you think about housing and those members of Congress who sort of, if you will, get it are are helping. You know, when 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 NMHC sits there and says, okay, who understands housing and the need for both the supply and the demand, and and is a a productive voice in the debate, whether on the Senate side or on the House side, who 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 are those people that people ought to you know um, uh, understand are doing a lot for the industry? Well, I, I was I was honored to have the opportunity to to testify before the Senate Finance Committee recently um, on housing, particularly on the affordable housing initiatives and other things. And, and, and I got to tell you, it was the most bipartisan hearing I have seen in Washington in 30 years. It, it was how um, Senator Wyden and Senator Crapo have managed that, that committee and are, are really focused on the opportunities that the tax code in particular can bring to housing um, all the way down both sides of the line. Um, the person that I, I think is, is something of a surprise, but has been involved in this for uh, the last couple of years is Senator Young from Indiana. Um, he's, uh, he's the co-sponsor of the affordable housing uh, tax credit bill, and he is on every single housing bill that has been proposed in that committee. Um, and, and he's just taken a real interest in it, and I think that's a great opportunity for us. So um, before I lose the two of you, um, not who's going to win in 24, but who are the two nominees uh, yeah. a year from now uh, on the Democratic side and on the Republican side. And and you can't just sort of say, well, it, because he's an incumbent, Joe Biden will be it. So, um, Jeff, let me start with you. Who's going oh to who's going to be the Democrat? And who's going to be the Republican nominees? Ah. It won't be a year. Well, it'll be close to a year from now. Right. It's coming yeah. up. Yeah, it will. Well, I I mean, signals are that Biden will run again. And so if he runs, I guess he will be the nominee. And if he doesn't run, then there's a a long bench, you know, behind him, starting with the vice president and then uh, uh, transportation secretary Buttigieg and on, and on and on and on. And but I but he seems to be signaling that he's going to run. And on the Republican side, um, I don't know. You asked about young, impressive uh, politicians. We did recently meet with the mayor of Miami, who was quite a charismatic fellow and an ambitious fellow. And uh, and Miami seems to be doing pretty well. So I, I don't know on the Republican side. It's 
I, I, I don't know. Sharon, your turn. Gee, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Um, on the Democratic side, yeah, I mean, I think you've got a lot of, you know, it, it all depends on what Biden is or really isn't going to do. Um, the, the sort of uh, elevation of Gretchen Whitmer, I think, is interesting. Um, and that's been going on for a while and, and, and talking to folks that, you know, work closely with the, the Democratic Party there, they see that as, as a possibility and, and something that they're continuing to talk to her about, although she, you know, remains, like all politicians, steadfastly focused on the office that which she holds. Um, on, on the Republican side, I just think, the, the, especially today, after yesterday, what happens with Trump is so uncertain and so volatile at this point, I don't even think you can make a prediction on it right now. It just depends on how that legal process moves forward. But, but you know what, Willie, that question raises the issue about how we, Sharon and I work here in Washington. And you know, we're, we, we talk to everybody, Republicans, Democrats, independent people, and try and impress upon them the value of strong real estate, uh, you know, asset values, the contributions they make to cities and, and budgets and, and for pensioners that are investing in them and all of that. And so, you know, we work with everybody and as long as they want to work, you know, with us and, and cross, cross aisle. So, you know, you kind of talk to them all. Yeah, I think our, I think our most important job, Jeff, is to be sure that we don't get pulled or weaponized. Um, and that, you know, I see that happening in housing already, which is really my biggest concern. Housing and real estate generally, but housing in particular is a bipartisan issue. It must be. People of all political persuasions need a roof over their heads in a civil society and insisting that no party try to take credit or, or demonize the other on different proposals, I think is critically important in the work we do. So, um, A, thank you both. B, I, I, I love those public service announcements at the end for both of your organizations and the great work that they do on behalf of everyone in our industry. And the third thing I will say is someone who isn't as, if you will, has to, someone who doesn't have to be as careful with my words as the two of you do, given who you interface with every single day. I would just say, A, I am hoping that a Democrat will pull a Ted Kennedy uh, and run against the incumbent president, as Ted Kennedy did against uh, Jimmy Carter uh, for the Democratic nomination in 1979. 80. Yeah, yeah, 79 uh, into the 80 election. Um, that would be really interesting to see. And then the other thing I would say on the Republican side, a lot of focus on Trump, a lot of focus on DeSantis. There are some Republican governors who term in 24. And the one thing I've known about politicians is they like new jobs in government and they don't like to go back to the private sector. And so um, someone like Glenn Youngkin, for instance, in Virginia, he's one term and he's done. And he has an option, either run for president of the United States or try and beat Tim Kaine for the, his Senate seat. I, I would honestly say to you that as they're doing their numbers in Virginia, they may think they got a better chance at national office than at, at, at state office if he's got to run against Tim Kaine. So I just throw a, a Yankin or a Polis in Colorado out there as potential people who might not be so mainstream that could actually surprise all of us come a year from now. Anyway, that's it from my my my, my uh, Monday morning. The work goes on. Scene. The dream continues. The march will never end or whatever. You, you got it. The two, <laughs> and I get to do it on a Monday morning. You guys both go to you both. You both go to battle every Sunday morning, if you will, to use the football analogy. So I get to just say it from my seat in the back of the theater. Um, thank you both. Uh, thank you. And uh, really appreciate your insights and input. And as Susan said at the top, I'm going to Philadelphia next week for my quarterly discussion with Peter Lineman, and I can guarantee you it will be really good and really, really interesting. So hope many of you can join us. Have a great day, everyone.